It's interesting how over the last number of months there's some words that are now part of our everyday vernacular that just weren't there certainly six months ago. Things like pandemic, things like social distancing, things like uh, unprecedented times. That's one that I've heard a lot of. Uh, flattening the curve which has got two meanings it turns out. Not only do we want to flatten the curve of COVID infections, but we also want to flatten the bulge as a result of our lockdown. Uh, in fact, one of my favourite little words, which I haven't heard too much, but I think will probably start getting fairly popular, is this whole idea of being a quarantubby. <laughs> That's definitely been the case uh, for me. One of the words that we got used to using uh, in the Christchurch earthquakes, which was unique to that particular time, was this whole word liquefaction. We talked about liquefaction a lot. And uh, we lived on the eastern suburbs when we went through the earthquakes, and that was an area that was very hard hit, and there was just a lot of liquefaction. So you'd be leaning over the fence talking to your neighbour, how bad is your liquefaction in your backyard, mate? And talk all about this. Now, liquefaction is where uh, there's water in the soil um, from either you know, the sea or from the river. There's a high water table. And as the pressure of, of the earth shaking, like because of the earthquakes, happens, it actually uh, liquefies the soil. So you've got liquid and this kind of liquid soil and all of that uh, produces pressure that bubbles up uh, and spills out into this kind of weird crud that was everywhere. And uh, so we had teams shoveling this stuff for months uh, from around the eastern suburbs doing the big clean up. But on the fancy side of town, on the west uh, side of Christchurch, uh, the land was very different. It was built on rock rocky ground and so uh, they didn't have those same issues isn't it interesting that sounds like a little parable that Jesus told about how we build our lives and whether we build our lives on practicing his way or whether we build our lives pursuing other things and when the storms of life come and they do the the foundation is revealed and uh, so I don't know about you, but I tell you what, there's been a lot of uh, liquefaction that's emerged in my life. <laughs> and that's because there's been a lot of pressure. I've been on the phone to uh, pastors and on the phone to people in our church, you know, every day. And, uh, and I haven't talked to a single person that is not experiencing some form of pressure. There's people with running businesses who um, have the pressure of, uh, of staff and their livelihoods and, and the future of their businesses. Uh, there's people with, um, you know, the pressure of uh, juggling kids at home and uh, and homeschooling and juggling jobs and all that sort of thing. Uh, there's pressure for those that um, are very, very lonely and would love to have a lot more noise and a lot more activity around them. There's pressure, interestingly, of people even just really bored. Uh, all of this produces a pressure on our lives. Both introverts and extroverts are facing pressure right now because our usual rhythms that we have in terms of how we're wired and how we fill our tanks, we just can't do that stuff anymore we're in one location and so there's this pressure that comes on and it produces liquefaction a classic example for me was on Wednesday night we're running our chapel service it's one of the highlights of the week for me I just love it and uh, we uh, have this contemplative restful very peaceful service and uh, we just say set prayers and we have silence and we rest in the presence of God. It's bliss. And so 15 minutes into this uh, last Wednesday, the internet crashed. My, the live stream stopped and I was just freaking out. I was like, oh no. And so I go from like total chill, contemplative to like total stress and then anger and frustration because I cannot find what is wrong. Rebooting programs doesn't work. Rebooting the computer doesn't work. Eventually I reboot the router which as you know takes 10 years to reboot and that solved the problem. And so then I'm like yes okay live stream we hit live stream we go and then I'm like oh no <laughs> I've got to lead a contemplative service and I'm stressed to the eyeballs. I'm angry. I want to throw this laptop just out the window. I'm over these online services in terms of just all the tech and stuff. And, and so then I'm like oh and all my attitude she was just stinky winky man and uh, thankfully at that point in the uh, service as we continued the service we were at the point of saying the confession together before we took communion oh I needed that so we went back into uh, taking confession and by the time that I'd finished that it was like oh we have come to a place where my soul was once more and the place I can just rest with God the filter for us in terms of how we're growing to become more like Jesus is the fruit of the Spirit. This is the evidence that we're becoming more like Jesus. This is the evidence the Holy Spirit's been at work in our life. And we actually don't know how we're doing when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit until there's pressure on our lives. That actually really reveals 
whether the fruit of the Spirit is just who we are, or whether there's work to do to try and reach and grow and, and develop that so that it's our predominant experience rather than the exception. And so uh, the reality for me, as I'm sure it is for everyone, if you're really honest, is like, man, <laughs> this sort of, these sort of moments reveal how much work there is still to do to shape and form us. And I don't say this in a condemning way or in a way to make anyone feel stink. It's just the reality, right? And, uh, and so um, this is where we're at. And this, these seasons reveal where our soul is really at. And so I've been sitting with the question, like in the midst of this time, you know, this time of just going, oh, okay, we ways to go and I'm not as, uh, as Christ-like as I thought and all that sort of thing. I've been sitting with this question, which I feel like is the question we need to be really sitting with a lot at the moment. And it's this, you may remember actually back in the day, there was those WWJD bracelets that uh, were going around and everyone, all the little cool Christians wore those. And um, I think the, the, the question at the moment is WWJSTY, what would Jesus say to you? WWJSTY, what would Jesus say to you in this moment with where you're at right now? And underneath that question, what would Jesus say to you, is actually the question, what is God like? What is God like? What is God like for you? Uh, A.W. Tozer, a famous writer uh, back in the day, said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing that, uh, most important thing about us. Do we see God as filled with infinite grace, mercy? Often there can be confusion uh, about God's attributes and God's essence. Let me explain. God's essence is love, like absolute, pure love. In 1 John it says, God is love. This is the, the climactic statement of all theology. This is who God is in his essence. He's love. And his attributes are things like holiness and justice and all these other things. And so, uh, so God is God. So, so any of those attributes will always feel like love because God's essence is love. And then all of these other attributes of God, his holiness and his justice and and uh, and his compassion, they're all just attributes. They just flow out of an essence of love. And this is why I get a little bit agitated when people. Uh, have this idea that God would send a pandemic somehow to either judge people or to somehow do something that would give him glory or that it's an end time sign. Uh, underneath those statements is actually confused theology and also is an image of God that does not line up with the picture that we see of who Jesus is. And, and so let me unpack that. Jesus, Jesus, Hebrews uh, 3 verse 1, uh, 1 verse 3, sorry, says that Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. being. So if we want to know what God is like, we look at Jesus. That's absolute 101 theology, hell you die on theology. There's no, there's no debate around this. Uh, and so... So the question about like, what would Jesus say to us? Well, the, what I've been doing is I've been looking at some of these moments as, that Jesus interacts with people in the Bible that are very human very, and broken, just like you and me. So for example, there's a couple of, let's look at a couple of examples. Zacchaeus up the tree, despised guy in the community. He's ripped off people. He's got um, small man syndrome. You've looked at this, uh, you've grown up in the Christian scene and gone to Sunday school. You've looked at the story in Sunday school. Climbs up the tree to try and see Jesus. But you've got to remember, this guy is a royal muppet. I mean, this guy uh, is a tax collector. And so what he does is that he takes taxes from the community that are higher than what the Roman levies are and amasses a whole lot of personal fortune that's his through this corrupt system. And the Romans don't care as long as they get their money. And so there, are, imagine there are people in, in the community that are going hungry, that are missing out, that are really struggling because of the taxes that they have to pay to this guy Zacchaeus. And so Zacchaeus, well, he may have a nice house and all the rest of it, but he knows deep down that he is not a loved guy and that people do not like him. But he's bowed down to the altar of money and says, screw what it means for other people. I'm going to amass this personal security and fortune for myself. But late at night, Zacchaeus, like anyone else, would be sitting there and feeling the acute loneliness, the rejection, and he would not like probably who he is deep down. He's up this tree. Jesus walks past and, and everyone in that crowd would love this prophet Jesus to go, 
to their place for dinner. And Jesus looks at Zacchaeus and he sees him for who he really is and says, Zach, mate, we're going to your place for dinner. You're the one I want to hang out with. And he makes him feel valued and he makes him feel special and he makes him feel loved. And it turns his whole life around where in that moment, Zacchaeus immediately gives half of his fortune away to bless people and he's set free and he's loved. He doesn't get judged or condemned by Jesus in any moment in that story. He gets loved by Jesus and that love sets him free. The woman caught in adultery is another classic example. I mean, here's this woman caught in adultery. I mean, the whole, the whole scene's so full on. Every time we mention the story, we've got to remember there's a guy involved as well who skedaddled off, who seems to get off scot-free, completely unjust. But that doesn't minimize what this woman's done. Huge pain, huge implications for families and for children and for all the pain in the community. I mean, it is wrong what she's done. But Jesus does not condemn her. He does not condemn her. He looks at her and says, woman, you are forgiven. Go and sin no more. You can do it. It's just so beautiful, the acceptance that Jesus gives this woman. Uh, the prodigal son, the apex story about uh, that Jesus tells to try and tell us what God is like. He says uh, the story about this kid who makes all these mistakes. Most of you guys know it really, really well. He's broken. He's messed up. He, he trudges home simply just with the motivation of at least I can hopefully get some food that the servants get. He's expecting judgment and rightly so and doesn't get any of it. He receives acceptance. He receives a celebration and he's welcomed up into the arms of love. Oh, it's incredible. This, all of these stories reveal what God is like according to Hebrews. Jesus is the exact representation of his being. There is only one time when Jesus talks about what his heart is like. In all of the Gospels and all of the great, all of the stories in the Scriptures, there's only one time in Matthew 11, Jesus says, this is what my heart is like. It is gentle and it is humble. That is what Jesus is like. Cy Rogers, who I talk about, in a second would said, God would far rather have you messy than not have you at all. This is what God is like. And so therefore, uh, with the fact that Jesus has seen your best moments, but especially because he knows what your worst moments have been over the last month, WWJSTY, what would Jesus say to you? I've got a couple of ideas that I want to throw out there, of course. Um, one of the things I think Jesus would do is, uh, the first thing I think Jesus would say is he would actually ask us a question because Jesus was very good at just asking the right questions. And I think Jesus would ask us this question, knowing the he'd know the answer, but he would ask us the question, how is your soul? How are, how's your soul? The real, I was thinking of this the other day because uh, in the States, the national director for the Vineyard Movement, which is the tribe that we are, uh, is this lovely, godly, humble man filled with integrity called Phil Strout. Just an absolute lovely, lovely guy. And he shared when he was over here a few years ago uh, just how forming that question had been for him because his two spiritual mentors had just consistently asked him that question as he began to grow in his discipleship journey. How is your soul? That was the consistent question, like, how is your soul? So I just want to play this little clip of him sharing about that question. My spiritual father had, had asked me the same thing, but in a different way. But this man drove home the point. How is your soul? And he had this wonderful voice for the radio. Was, oh, Phil, how's your soul? And, you know, I, there was times when I wasn't so good on the inside. What he wanted to know was, what's going on on the inside, Phil? How are you on the inside? Not what you're manufacturing, not what's going on outside. How are you on the inside? You know, I came to realize that, that Proverbs talks about guard your heart for out of it come the issues of life. And that, that the reason we take care of our soul and that question is so important is because everything that's inside is going to come out. It comes out manifested. And so I think as we talk about this, the simple question, how is your soul, has really for me just come to mean, how are you really doing? When all the masks are off, when all the band is, the band's gone home, there's no hoorah, nobody's looking, how are you on the inside? Just a very 
probing question. And it's a question that it's good for us to consistently be wrestling with. But I think especially in this time, the question, how is your soul, is so important. Before we went into lockdown, most of us are running too fast in life to probably be able to answer that question with real insight and clarity about how we're really doing. And maybe there's a few of us that have had to keep going because of circumstances in the midst of this lockdown. But I think for many of us, we've had to slow down. Our travel schedules stopped. Our, um, you know, our activity outside of our house has obviously stopped. And at this moment, it's very helpful to just go like, where am I really at? How am I really doing? Because I think Jesus looks at us with eyes with nothing but compassion and says, how is your soul? How's your inner being? How's it, how are you really doing? Like all the things that you've done in, in life and all the rhythms, are they working for you? Like, is it shaping you into the person that you know I want you to be, says Jesus? So I think that would be one of the questions he would ask us. Like, how is your soul? How are you really doing? And if we have a right understanding of who God is, we can answer that question with brutal honesty and there's no fear. And there's no fear because perfect love, and remember God in his absolute essence is love, perfect love casts out all fear. So I can be brutally honest about where I'm okay, where I'm smashing it, and especially I can be really honest about where I'm struggling and where I'm a bit disappointed in myself and where like, I'm just seeing, oh my gosh, there's a real lack of the things like the fruit of the Spirit in that sort of space. The second thing that... I think Jesus would say, comes out of this passage from uh, Isaiah 40 verse 31. And it's a passage I, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago because I think it's one of those passages that's super important for us at the moment. It's one of these, for me, it's a bit of an anchor at the moment. And Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, those who hope in the Lord, or some translations say wait on the Lord, this idea of looking to him, uh, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. This beautiful promise, well, they'll renew their strength. So as we look to, to God, as we look to him, he renews our strength. As we put our hope in him, that's where, that's where my hope is. That's the rock I'm building my life on. And then it says, they'll soar on wings like eagles. eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Now, the thing that is very interesting for me, and this is a question, this is, uh, this is what I think Jesus would say to us, but let me unpack this because it comes out of this, is that in that passage, out of this thing, whole idea that uh, we will be, re be renewed, our strength will be renewed, there is then a continuum that this passage shares about. So it talks about people that are soaring on wings like eagles. I mean, we've had those moments, some of you may be in that moment uh, and really just thriving, you're just like, life is just epic, I'm soaring with Jesus at the moment, it is just every day I wake up and I am alive in my soul and I'm making great choice after great choice and when the pressure comes on I'm so pleased with what is bubbling out of me and it's like I'm soaring baby yeah as I put my hope in him and uh, and so God bless you if that's you <laughs> most of the people I'm talking to and I'm going to definitely put myself in this boat I'm not soaring right now. We're not soaring right now. So what else does the passage say? It says you can run and not grow weary. And it's like, okay, I'm not soaring, but I'm, I'm running, man. And, and man, as I look to Jesus, I'm, I'm just sensing this inner strength. So I'm doing really well, actually. Like I'm not soaring, but man, I'm pretty good. And then the next, next statement is I'm walking and not fainting. And it's like, okay, whew, huh. Okay, I'm ticking along, and I'm keeping my eyes on Jesus, and I'm not fainting. That's the win. And I think if you continue the continuum, you could get to the point where you're crawling and not collapsing. <laughs> like, oh, okay, I'm heading in the right direction. Still got my hope in Jesus, and man, it's incredible, but I'm crawling and I'm not collapsing. <laughs> And here's the, the point. I think Jesus would say to us in the crawling and not collapsing phase and the walking and not fainting and the running and not growing weary, any of these spaces, he would say, well done, that's a win. Well done. If you're walking and not fainting, pat yourself on the back right now. That's enough. 
if you're crawling and not collapsing, that's still a win. Well done. Like, honestly, I think we've got to take the pressure off ourselves to live some super triumphalistic life where we're living in the victory all the time. It is just not helpful. The triumphalism, some, and you hear these messages all the time, you know, every season I'm going to thrive. It's like, no, sometimes in some seasons, the win is to walk and not faint. And that is awesome. That is enough. Well done if that's you. Honestly, I felt like Jesus was just saying that to me just this week. It's like, I haven't smashed this season. I haven't been living in the victory and soaring on wings of eagles. I've been walking and not fainting. And I'm like, I felt like Jesus is like, well done, Sam. You're walking and not fainting. And I'm like, yeah, Jesus, some days it's felt like I've crawled and I haven't collapsed. And it's like, yes, that's also a win. Well done, Sam. You're doing really well. Oh, honestly, guys, I think we need to take a whole lot of pressure off, on, off ourselves. And I think Jesus wants to take that pressure off us as well. Honestly, I think that's one of the things he would say to us. Take the pressure off yourself. You know, we came into this lockdown and, you know, and it's like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to learn five languages and I'm going to learn to paint finally and I'm going to learn to whittle a whole lot of wood and I'm going to make a whole cutlery set out of whittled wood. And, and it's like... <laughs> Yeah, and I'm going to become a spiritual giant through this time. And it's oh, honestly, guys, we need to take the pressure off ourselves here, and also we need to stop comparing ourselves to to what we think other how other people are doing. Again, guys, I'm on the phone. I'm talking to lots of people. Most people are struggling, and that's okay as long as we keep looking to Jesus. As long as we keep looking to Jesus. As long as we put our hope in Him, and especially as our understanding of who Jesus is get shaped into more a more biblical picture of who he who he actually is then actually you want to go to Jesus to rest you want to go to Jesus for comfort you want to to let your sin propel you towards God not away from him as we get a greater understanding of how humble and gentle in heart Jesus is and that at his essence he is the God of love now there can be the dangers in this season uh, that we can not continue to walk or to run or to even crawl forward is that we can go back, we can regress. And again, if that's been the case, it's all right, it's fine because we can boldly approach the throne of grace. You know, one of the little ways, to be honest, I've regressed is that I've been... Um, I was really proud because at the start of this year, I kicked my, my nasty cheese and crackers habit, which I would have every single night. And I was like, ooh, I've done quite well. I've broken that habit. What a good boy. I'm tracking in the right direction here. And then this quarantubby kind of time hit, and it's like I've been smashing back those cheese and crackers. <laughs> now, I don't know what the cheese and crackers are for you, uh, but there can be a danger that we can, uh, we can go to things and try and get a whole lot of comfort out of them that actually um, aren't things that are helpful for our soul. And uh, it's interesting because disappointment often leads us to go back. It's with the disciples, you know, in the midst of all that went on over that uh, Easter weekend, there's huge confusion, huge stress. The adrenal adrenal glands would have been completely shot. Just, you know, a similar way to all the ways that we've been feeling, these guys had this intense experience. And then Jesus rose from the dead, and it's like, what does it all mean? They were spinning out. And in uh, John chapter 21, verse 3, Peter says, let's go back fishing. And if you dive a little bit deeper into the text here and look at the original language and stuff, he's not saying let's just go back for a cheeky fish. He's saying let's go back to that lifestyle of just fishing. That's actually just a lot safer and more comfortable. And that's after he'd been called out from fishing, the fishing uh, gig, to become a fisher of men, to follow Jesus. And, to, and he obviously becomes the one that starts the church. But uh, he, at this point, it's like, let's just go back. And that's what happens often when you get disappointed about the dreams that you've got for your future that just seem to be really up in the air at the moment and all this pressure that we're under and all this uncertainty all of a sudden there can be this danger of I want to go back and uh, and so let's just let's be careful that that's not the case if it has been the case over the last month it's all good let's let's run to the throne of grace let me uh, help you by 
uh, playing this little video of my friend Cy Rogers. Uh, Cy, a friend of mine, he passed away on Monday, got the, uh, the text on Monday night. Um, very big deal. I wasn't a close friend of his, but he had impacted my life enormously because uh, in my teenage years, Cy and his wife Karen and his daughter Grace moved to the Kapiti Coast and, uh, and lived there while their daughter went to high school, went to my high school. And so uh, this Cy Rogers was an international speaker, huge ministry, in demand globally, incredibly smartest guy I think I've ever met, uh, insane life story. And even in uh, this video, if you haven't heard him speak before, you'll see mannerisms and stuff that might spin you out. But incredible life story about God's redemptive healing work, incredible. Um, and he set up, him and two other international big deals that lived in the Kapiti Coast for some reason, decided to set up this little group to mentor um, just the, some of the teenagers, the Christian teenagers in the place. And so I wound up in this little group with Cy Rogers and two other massive international speakers. And, uh, and they just loved us and served us and discipled us. And man alive, did they help uh, us enormously in those years and, and, and to this day I'm mean, indebted to them. So I stayed in touch with Cy over the years and he'd been a good friend. In fact, one of the things uh, that um, he shot before our launch was a little video that saying to our launch team, guys, whatever you do, get out now while you still can. <laughs> and uh, lovely guy. <clears throat> and uh, so he, I want to play this video of his because he really helps unpack uh, the pressures that we can be on and how we can respond in a godly way to them. So check this out. I talked a lot about principles that made a difference for me, including the fact that when I came to the Lord, the blood of Jesus did wash away my, uh, my guilt, but not my memory. And I had a lot of defilement that I had to bring to God again and again. But I could at least begin to talk honestly to God. I figure he knew what he was getting into when he adopted me. And part of that conversation went something like this. Look at what I'm thinking, God. I'd love to indulge that, but I'd really like to indulge you. Now that my eyes are open to you, I want you more than I want that. Lord, look, that calls my name, but you call my name. Help me. Lord, that asks for my allegiance, but you ask for my allegiance. Back me up and help me bow to you, not to that anymore. And I began to run to God, not from God, running to him over and over. And you know what, ladies? As I practice this week in and week out, month after month, and after a couple of years, and you think years, it took a few years to get the defilement established. It took a little time to work it out, but you know what? What's a few years of investment when it brings you back to God anyway? The bad thing becomes the good thing if it pivots you back to God rather than taking you away from Him. And so, instead of feeling bad thinking God is mad, I ran to God knowing that He's my best advocate. And I began to admit and submit my dirt to Him. And after practicing this again and again, I suddenly realized it had been four or five days without a single dirty thought. I was so overwhelmed and amazed, and it may not seem like a big deal to you, but having been molested as a kid, growing up being pornographic and promiscuous, I could not remember a day where I was not harassed and haunted by sexually intrusive thoughts until now. I thought, wow, I wonder if God did do that lobotomy I asked for. I wonder if he erased my memory. And I promptly went to the filing cabinet to see if indeed he had erased memory, and he did not, so I do not recommend that approach. All the memories were there, but here's the difference. It was their power and authority over me that had been vanquished. I now had a new master I bowed down to instead of the old one. So don't be ashamed of your history and don't be ashamed of your humanity. God would not hold it over your head. He would give you an opportunity, an invitation, and a process to bring your dirt to him that he can make you clean. Just love, I love that. That whole sermon's amazing. I might just see if I can track it down and post it for you guys. It's just, I love that line. Lord, I, I want that, but I want you more. I want you more. And so uh, one of the things that Sai said, he said it in, in one way, shape or form in there is this idea of like, let, let's let our sin propel us towards God, not away from him. Like that is honestly in my DNA as a follower of Jesus now. I'm like, I want to, when I make mistakes, I'm going to run to you, not away from you. And so if you have made mistakes in terms of how you have coped with this season, that's okay. If you keep coming back to Jesus saying, I want you more, I want you more. In Romans 5 uh, verse 3, it says, perseverance produces character. 
And it's not just perseverance, like I've got to grip my teeth and get... Yes, there's a bit of that, but it's actually perseverance and trusting in the nature and character of God to cleanse us, to free us, and to lead us into life, all held in the kitty of love. That, like, that is the perseverance that we're talking to. Uh, you've got to persevere. You will make mistakes. Liquefaction will come up, but we don't bail on the journey with him. He will bring that work to completion one day if we consistently keep coming back to him, to the throne of grace and receiving mercy in our hour of need. There's only a few things I'm really proud of and feel like I can brag about in my Christian life. And, and one of them is this, that I can get back on the wagon. I'm good at getting back on the wagon. When I fall off the wagon in terms of my devotional life, I've got the, onto the habit of getting back onto the wagon. Some, no, I'm not saying immediately. Sometimes that can take a couple of weeks or months or whatever, but it's like I will always get back on the wagon in terms of the vision I have for how I want to live my life. And when I fall, sh and that's the vision of just wanting to be like Jesus and, and and be with him, become like him, do what he did, all of this. And, and when I fall short of that, I, I'm just like, I'm going to get back on the wagon. When I make mistakes in leadership, I want to repent and apologize, and I'm going to get back on the wagon. When I make mistakes, or when, you know, as a husband or as a father, I want to, I, I want to just get back on the wagon. And this is one of the great things I think Jesus has wanted to say is like, is like, just plot along with me. Plot along with me. Even if you make mistakes, continue just to plot along with me. You don't have to soar on wings of, of eagle. There's no expectation that has to be the default every single season. Sometimes we've got to plod along with him and just persevere with Jesus. Mike Pilavachi says this, Perseverance is underrated. Lord, give me the gift of plodding, the determination to obey you in all circumstances. Can I encourage you that if this has been a, a pretty average season when it comes to good choices, and this moment, so I'm getting back on the wagon and I'm going to walk with you, Jesus. Help me today as I look to you, as I put my hope in you, and even now as I wait on you, that you would renew my strength so that I can walk with you and not faint. And the last thing I uh, want to suggest that Jesus would say to us, WWJSTY, is that he would say the words from Matthew 11, come to me and rest. Come to me and rest. I think actually this is one of the statements Jesus wants to stay, say to Western culture, full stop. Like within all of the crazy, you can come to me and you can find true rest. For my burden, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What does he mean by that? My expectations are light on you. The light. Now the biggest expectation Jesus has is that we would simply come to him. And if we have the right understanding of who Jesus is, that is no hard thing to carry. It's not a burden that's heavy. So like, why wouldn't you want to hang out with Jesus, especially when you've made mistakes, especially when you feel like you're a bit of a mess. You don't have to get clean to come to Jesus. We go to Jesus to get clean, to find wholeness, to be renewed, to be restored. So we can come to him and rest. And his yoke is easy, his burden is light. Again, I think we often put pressure and expectations on ourselves, even sometimes spiritually, that like that Jesus isn't giving us. Like this we, guys, there's enough pressure on all of your worlds right now without adding more pressure about smashing it right now. It's okay to plod along with Jesus, but make sure it's with him. Let's make sure it's with him that we're close to Jesus. If it's got a bit messy, that we run to God, not away from him. And so I want to pray for us as we finish this morning, that we would hear his voice. Those are a couple of thoughts about what Jesus would say to us, that he would Firstly, ask us, like, how's your soul? That he would say to us, it's okay if you're running and not fainting or walking and, uh, and not growing weary. Uh, so running and not growing weary, walking and not fainting. And I would suggest crawling and not collapsing. He's like, it's okay if that's you. And the third thing I think he would say is just come to me and rest. Come to me and rest. Come and learn to rest with me. And uh, there's other things that he'll want to say to you. And so let's just give a little moment for Jesus to speak to us this morning, to encourage us, to minister to us, 
and to build us up, to lift us up, to encourage us, to restore us, to renew us, to make us like new. Lord, we just uh, pause in this moment. Come. Come, Lord, and minister to us. And Lord, we've been asking the question this morning, what would you say to us? Lord, I've had some ideas, but I just pray now you'll come and you'd speak to us, your children, and you'd speak to every person watching words of encouragement, words of hope. Let's just pause for a second and invite Jesus just to speak to us in the stillness of this moment. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are the God that speaks to us today. And Lord, we want to continue to walk with you. Even in the midst of the challenges and pressures of the season, help us to be formed into your likeness more and more. This we ask in the precious, beautiful, loving name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.